Welcome back, Troglodytes, to your daily dose of guitar information, the Troglodytes Guitar Show. So my newfound love, the very early 90s of Gibson. There's so many cool undiscovered treats and gems and weird limited editions in this era that I decided to pick this one up from a shop. A couple of months ago, they had listed on Reverb a whole bunch of new old stock Gibsons. And uh, when I bought this, they told me a bit more that it was like a shop owner who had just held all this stuff back. But he had ended up passing away, so his estate is liquidating his collection or his wife. I, I didn't really dig too far into it. But unfortunately, a lot of these guitars were not stored properly, so they got a whole bunch of finish checking. This one didn't seem too bad from the photos. But when I saw this, the top really intrigued me. And then there was one other unique special feature of this 1991 Gibson Les Paul. Let's go ahead and open it up and see what it's like. We've got the thin case shroud, but take a look at this top. I thought it looked so fascinating. It has like almost a Koa-like appearance to it. You know how I like my spotlight specials? There's just like a slightly wider part of the wood in the center there. So that piqued my interest. It was a natural Les Paul custom with some interesting wood grain and flame figuring here. It still has the protective coating over top of the pick guard. That's always one of my favorite things on like these new old stock guitars. But then wait till you see the headstock on this. So that's normal, but on the back side we have a custom shop edition decal. Unfortunately, I, I think this one might have received some shipping damage. That's kind of a buzzkill, kind of like that 2005 standard that we had reviewed not too long ago. But this almost feels like it got dropped. But anyways, the review shall go on for this. But it has a Custom Shop Edition decal on the back. And I know I sound like a broken record at this point, but Custom Shop Edition does not mean this is a Custom Shop guitar because the Custom Shop did not exist until late 1993. This was a limited edition of some sort. Sometimes this could have been like a NAM show display piece. They could get those or Custom Shop original decals. Other times, this is the catalog era, like before the website was really taken off. So you could find these catalogs that would have these special custom guitars that you could order from there, and most of those would have the Custom Shop Edition decal. So one that you could check out that I've also reviewed and documented would be this one. It's a bird's eye Les Paul standard, but man, look at that top. It's so shiny. This is a very impressive flame top. Like, it's not the usual flame figuring without the line is the best way to describe this top. Like, you can still see some lines within the figuring, but most of it's just like the uh, color-changing effect of the maple. That's a really cool Les Paul custom. So that's likely what this was, some sort of a catalog guitar. There's definitely finish checking all over the face of the headstock. I mean, it's a darn shame all these really clean guitars were not stored properly. I mean, even the neck on this thing has some decent flame figuring for mahogany. I mean, this is a very nice example. So I just wanted to pick it up, show it to you guys. We'll have to uh, take a look at it on the workbench. But it's been a long time since I've seen a Les Paul Custom have the Custom Shop Edition decal. The only other thing I can think of from this particular era, outside of those catalog guitars, were like the Super 400 Les Paul Custom. That's another custom that had a decal like that. So let's see, did he keep any of this other paperwork? Oh yes! Gibson Quality and Prestige Innovation 5-Year Warranty. That's nice to have. Talks about the case combo lock and original truss rod tool. But anyways, let's go ahead and throw this one on the workbench and take an individual look at its parts and specs. Inside this 1991 Les Paul Custom, there were a few surprises. So first off, let's take a look at our pickups. This is a late 91. So this is the era when they're starting to use these Gibson USA base plates that we know and love yet today. However, our bridge pickup does not have that. It does not even have the patent number embossed ones like we would normally have. So I'm almost curious, did this get a 57 Classic that had a decal that worn off and like a 490 in the neck? We're going to have to take some readings within the circuit to see if we can figure this out. Because I doubt anybody's ever modified this guitar. So that's about 8k ohms in the neck. And then our bridge... 13.04, so that kind of lines up with the usual 490R, 498T set that you typically find in customs of this era. So I'm guessing this could just be a transitional pickup where they were going from that regular stamp base plate that they had 
into these and maybe they just had some that weren't completely embossed you know kind of like what they would do for the PAFs I'm I'm not really sure I'll have to look into here just to make sure that those are the original pickups but it reads like the pickups you normally find in here so that could just be kind of a weird anomaly a part of Gibson history that we didn't know before but here's another interesting thing about this one inside our neck pickup cavity it's stamped HCSB for Heritage Cherry Sunburst I don't know about you guys, but th this this doesn't look like <laughs> Heritage Cherry Sunburst to me. This happens. Sometimes they'll just pull something off the line that happens to look good. They'll do it in natural or whatever fancy finish that they were doing for these catalog guitars. That is not uncommon. You can also find that in the Norlin era. So I'm sure some guys might open this and be like, hmm, has this been refinished? I mean, it's a possibility, but I highly doubt it because... I don't think you'd be able to get all that cherry stain out of a guitar like this and then finish it in natural. When somebody strips those, you can normally tell there'll be a red tinge to it. But there's also in red lettering LPCC, likely having to do something with Les Paul Custom. Not quite too sure why there's two C's. And then as you find in guitars of this era, there's normally a date stamp. Now that looks to me like maybe May 25th, probably 1991 or 1990, something like that. It's kind of all smudged, hard to read. And then we have something in here. I'm honestly not sure. It looks like maybe an A-L-O and something. If anybody recognizes that, please let me know. I know sometimes you'll find things like Tom Murphy's signature in here. So that could be an employee that could have something to do with the finish. It could also have something to do with the history of this model, like why it exists. But you can see all that vintage buffing compound still in here, that beautiful two-piece maple top. We're within the nine-hole weight relief era for these customs until they move into the custom shop and do like year-specific reissues. But as far as the USA made ones, I mean, you have to remember at this point in time, customs were production level line instruments, just like a standard or a deluxe. They didn't get moved all the way into the custom shop until it's around 2003, 2004. But again, the custom shop reissues. I mean, those start, you know, around 93, 94 when the custom shop finally opens. But anyways, the gold hardware is very clean. I mean, it's got some wear, but just about every inch as nice as a brand new set of 490R, 490T pickups. Those are very good for this age. As far as a bridge tailpiece setup here, same stuff. I don't even want to handle this stuff with just bare hands. That's how clean it is. And then of course, a full weight golden tailpiece here. Now let's just take a moment to appreciate this. It's such a interesting top. I've never seen anything quite exactly like this. I'm sure this is a really high grade of wood. It just has a lot of figure changing in it, I want to say. I mean, it's got the up and down natural wood grain lines you can see everywhere. But as far as, once again, those hard lines, it's like a really ultra wide flame that just doesn't necessarily leave what you normally think of when you think flame top, especially in the center stripe. That's kind of why I was calling it a koa topped instrument because sometimes koa will have, you know, lines like that. Not every single koa guitar, obviously, but that, that's just what that reminded me of. It is a beautiful piece of maple. I mean, we're technically within what a lot of people call the good wood era. But anyways, our knobs, two volumes, two tones. You can see the font of the numbers there. Normally I expect it to be a little bit bolder, but this could also be a transitioning period because a lot starts to change, you know, around that 92, 93. Gibson finally figured out what they're doing with the classics and reissues and stuff. And they're just starting to do the best that they can with sourcing high quality woods. But all right, let's move on to our neck. We've got the mahogany neck with our ebony fretboard. Nothing too fancy here. 22 medium jumbo frets with your mother of pearl block inlays. 12 inch radius. Now the only thing I am seeing here is like the edges of the fretboards. It's always interesting being able to see like new old stock stuff. Because a lot of guys will rag on new Gibsons being like, ah, oh, it had blemishes from the factory. I mean, maybe they were just like that before too. Like you can see this but I can't feel it. Like, I'm not sure what that is. It's like they tapered off the edge of the fretboard. I mean, I'm confident it's not wear because these frets are just fantastic. It does not appear that this guitar was ever heavily played. As far as detailed neck specs, I get 1.67 inches at the nut, 
2.03 by the 12th, 0.81 at the first fret neck depth, and 0.98 by the 12th, but I'm going to take that at the 11th as well because I feel that's a little bit misleading, 0.94. Because at the 12th, you're kind of starting to get into the swoop of the heel. This is a very thin 60s style neck, as most customs are from this particular era. Here that is on the contour gauge, first fret, 12th fret. Kind of small feeling up here, then widens up just a bit. Very rounded. Now we've got our face of the headstock. The lacquer is surprisingly clean. Like, it's got a bit of a yellow tint, mainly around the binding, but like as far as the face of the headstock, that is white as the day it was new. You can see our truss rod's in good shape. Doesn't look like anybody's ever really had to touch that. And the regular Les Paul custom truss rod cover here. Nothing too fancy with that. Now let's move on to the backside, taking a look at the electronics first. Not the cleanest soldering work we've ever seen. What particularly looks strange in this one is the uh, three-way toggle switch. Normally more things get attached to here rather than to these other locations, but that could just be a small thing. I do notice that the toggle switch is like weirdly crooked this way. It's like it was set crooked at the factory or it just got bent, I'm not sure. I mean, looking in here, it doesn't look like anything's ever been changed, but who knows. But the pots date to the 43rd week of 1991. So that pretty well matches the serial number almost to the T. And you can see this one actually has black shielding paint and you can see all the vintage buffing compound over top of that. So you know that's original, even though they're still doing the metal base plates. Gold's looking great on the output jack. You've got golden strap buttons that have not been changed on this one. And just some nice plain mahogany wood grain back here. Nothing too fancy. I mean, it's got a slight shimmer to it with the way it dances, but nothing like the top or the neck. The neck I just love. I mean, you can see some of that flamed figuring. Flamed mahogany is way more rare on a Gibson guitar than maple. I mean, most maples will have some sort of a figuring that they use, unless it's like really plain, but mahogany. That's why I love the 90s ones. That's why I love the early 2000s. They had got some really nice stuff. But as far as finish checking, there's some here by the heel. Now, sometimes finish checking in this area, you want to be very careful. Does that mean the neck potentially has moved or anything? This one, eh, it doesn't look like it to me. And you can see there's one over here as well. Some kind of by the fretboard. The dealer was showing me this one. And then there's like another one that kind of stems from up here, not necessarily the nut. The only time you should really be concerned is when you see something like this guy, when the crack stems directly from the nut on the side and runs up here. Sometimes that can actually be a real crack in the wood. This one though, just looks like the finish has shrunk around the nut and that caused some stuff to happen. Also could have potentially happened during shipping, but that one's pretty minor. Now this guy is kind of scary because that looks a little bit deeper. And then obviously we have this guy that I wanted to blacklight to really be sure. When you run your nail along a finished check, you should be able to like lightly feel it. But if your nail like completely stops and you can like rip it up with your nail, that's when you know it's, it's a really deep finish crack. And generally actual cracks in the finish will glow differently. They'll have that little line right there. Whereas the one that you were seeing earlier that stems further down, it completely disappears under black light. So that one's a crack in the finish. That's a crack in the finish. There you can kind of see that line I was talking about. That one's kind of iffy. I mean, do you guys see the difference between that and this? I mean, sometimes it can be hard to tell. You can't do anything about this. You just kind of have to live with it. The only way to repair that is you could have a guy take the finish off the neck and respray it, but then people are going to think you're hiding a repair because you did that. So it's just best just to leave it as is. These are very minor. Let's take a look at the top real quick. Everything is looking the way I would expect to see. A guitar of this vintage. If you're wondering why the knobs don't glow, it's because after about 1985, they stopped glowing. They changed the materials that they use. How do I know? That's just experience blacklighting a lot of guitars. Back side of our guitar is looking good, as are our edges. So nothing to worry about there. But there we can see our serial number, 329th day of 1991. All said and done, this one's a bit chunky. Just a hair under 10 pounds, 9 pounds, 13.4 ounces. Let's go ahead, plug it in, and hear how it sounds. All right, let's go ahead and grab some basic tones out of this, starting with our neck pickup.
pickup has a lot of spank to it. That'd be to be expected though with it being twice as hot. kind of nice in between for that middle. All right, let's go ahead and try some distorted tones. Now that we know all about this beautiful limited edition Gibson Les Paul Custom, what are my final thoughts on this thing? It's actually a pretty nice playing guitar. I lost the top E string I was playing it so much. <laughs> but uh, unfortunately, I initially bought this one for my own personal collection because again, it's got the Custom Shop Edition decal. It has a really interesting maple top to it that just dances at every single angle. I mean, this is one of the more active tops I've ever seen. But unfortunately, the... Uh, the whole mystery behind the finished checks and finished cracks on the back of the headstock kind of sours this example for me personally, but I know there's a lot of guys that are gonna be like, dude, I can't believe you're passing up this example because it is quite fantastic. So no, it's not gonna be like $8,000 like it would have been, but I guess you can check it out in my shop. It's either that or I do have a change of heart and I end up keeping it because it's just such a fascinating top. I've never seen another one quite like this. It doesn't look good hanging on a stand. You really have to just hold this one in your hands to get the true beauty out of it. So 90s customs, do I suggest them? I personally like the 70s and 80s ones just a hair bit better, but if you're looking for something with a little bit more of a modern flair to them, but yet still have a certain old vintage feel, that's what I suggest the 90s customs for, especially if you like beautifully flamed and or quilted tops because you can find some really nice custom pluses in this era. So if you got nothing else from this video, 90s customs, they're quite nice. And if you happen to run across a limited edition one, they can be even nicer. So troglodytes, I hope you enjoyed tonight's episode. Don't forget to like, comment, and subscribe, and we will catch you tomorrow on the next episode. Take care.